The distinctive sound of the Mackinac Bridge is due to the grating in the two center lanes, one going each way. This grating allows air to pass through the bridge rather than pushing against it. Part of the reason for this technology was the collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge years earlier in Washington State. There's footage of this. You see the entire bridge convulsing and rolling like a wave in the wind before plunging into the ocean below. There's an abandoned black sedan in the middle of it. In mere seconds before it breaks apart, a man in a trench coat reaches the edge and looks back over his shoulder. He was trying to rescue a three-legged, paralyzed cocker spaniel named Tubby, trapped in the back seat of that car. Panicked, the dog repeatedly bit him and left him no choice but to return to safety alone. Neither Tubby's body nor the car were ever recovered. This video went viral, as viral as anything could go in the 1940s, and certainly every engineer took notice. The whole idea of suspension bridges was put on hold, and the designer responsible for this disaster lost his next commission, which was, as I'm sure you've guessed, the Mackinac Bridge. Thirteen years later, a new designer, David Steinman, was tapped to revive the project. He'd built bridges in Thailand, England, Portugal, Italy, Brazil, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Canada, Korea, Iraq, and Pakistan. But when he arrived at the Straits of Mackinac, he was speechless. It would be the longest suspension bridge in the world. He said later, I confess I was awed by my first view of the vast expanse of water to be bridged. One shore was hardly visible from the other. My awe turned into a silent prayer. But four years later, Big Mac was up and running at a length of 26,372 feet, roughly five times the length of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Anyway, it's a marvel, and the grating in the center lanes is one of the things that makes it possible. Sadly, the construction project itself was nothing short of an epic, and five workers did die during construction. Decades later, in 1989, a lightweight yoga driven by a 31-year-old waitress from Detroit was blown off the bridge into the water 200 feet below. On especially windy days, cars still cross over in convoys. The woman in the yoga, Leslie Ann Pluar, was heading to meet her boyfriend in St. Ignace, the town immediately at the end of the bridge, and the place where I attended my first and probably only 350th birthday party. I learned of the birthday right as I was leaving town. Someone handed me a brochure in a gas station convenience store, and I decided to stick around. Over the course of the next two days, I attended a lumberjack show, beaded my very own Ojibwe bracelet in a workshop led by an elderly native woman, and took a cemetery walk led by a local historian. As we completed our tour of the Lakeside Cemetery, our group held a brief moment of silence looking out at the bridge. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to be thinking about, so I just stood there, looking around with my eyes on the bridge, listening to leaves crackling softly in the breeze. It's really a lovely spot, so green and quiet and calming. I think I might have accidentally started to meditate when a huge set of bagpipes suddenly boomed behind me. I was so startled, I almost tripped over one of the graves. Apparently, a local piper had been summoned to finish our tour with a bang. That's actual audio, by the way. You're welcome. This sound is probably a little more comforting and familiar. It's the initial volley of the cornhole tournament later that night in the cove at the actual 350th birthday party. I ate my share of cake, drank my share of local brew in the beer tent, and talked with locals while an unforgettable night of cornhole madness unfolded before us. Seriously though, I absolutely love local events like this. 
During the concert that followed, I heard an older couple singing along to the bar band rendition of Madonna's 1984 hit, Like a Virgin. They were on a beach overlooking Lake Huron, swaying and singing into each other's eyes. But they had replaced the word virgin with sturgeon, altering the lyrics to say, like a sturgeon caught for the very first time, like a stir er er gin. For those of you who don't know, a sturgeon is a fish commonly caught in the cold waters of the Upper Peninsula. It's a literal dinosaur, roughly 175 million years older than the Velociraptor and Tyrannosaurus rex. And when other dinosaurs went extinct, the sturgeon, a hyperdurable bottom feeder with bony plated armor, just kept swimming. Today they live to be over a hundred years old and as large as seven feet and 200 pounds. I learned a lot about St. Ignace this weekend, and because of that, I want to give it its own episode in our Black Label app. You can find it there if you're interested. Among other things, St. Ignace is the third oldest continuously inhabited city in the United States, and it's full of rich European and native histories. On my way out of St. Ignace, I was directed to a ghost town called Fayette, a couple of hours down the Lake Michigan coastline. Without any other ideas, I got back in the truck and headed that way. About 10 miles outside of Fayette, I got lost, and I don't know if it was just the mood I was in, but I started to freak out a little bit. I took a wrong turn in an especially remote area, way out of cell phone service, and I still can't find it on the map. I mean, I can circle the area, but that's it. I just know at some unmarked point on a dark, endlessly winding road covered by trees, I did a Jason Statham style U-turn and beat it out of there in a cloud of dust. I had this overwhelming sense that something was profoundly wrong. I didn't see people, but I felt like I was being watched and I had no idea by who or for what or even if it was happening. After five or six miles of driving deeper in the woods, I found myself saying aloud, this isn't right, something's not right. Without even realizing that I was speaking, I heard myself say it before I realized I was saying it, which only added to the sense of not being alone. Then I heard myself say, without meaning to say it, this is off, you need to leave, now. And so I did. And even remembering it today from my couch the hair is standing up on my arms. I have no idea why. You can see in the official MDOT state map, there are no roads east of Fayette. And even if there were, I wouldn't be able to tell you which I was on. I was so disoriented, I couldn't have pointed north with four tries. But if any listener makes it out there, on your next casual trip in that area, please reach out and tell me who or what it was I was running away from. Anyway, Fayette itself, which I eventually found, was beautiful. Pretty much everything you'd hope a ghost town to be. Apparently, this is known as the, quote, banana belt of Michigan. There's less snow and a more moderate climate in this little spike of land than any other part of the UP. There must have been two dozen buildings, most of them open to the public. One of the houses had an exhibit called who was the addict, based on a small cache of empty morphine bottles found in the wall during renovations, all of which are now on display. Along with those bottles, a long strip of white lace was found, having once been used to raise and lower these bottles into place where no one else would find them. As shocking as it might sound, you used to be able to order morphine over the counter or even through the mail. It was used to treat things like diarrhea, or a common cough. Together, the bottles in that display would have contained nearly 9,000 doses. I can't help but wonder who the person was who placed them there. It might have been a bored, desperate housewife. It might have been an injured smelter, treating his pain and becoming addicted. The same way people get hooked on oxy today. Morphine is an opioid after all. As pretty as Fayette may look on days like this, it's important to remember how different it would have been 150 years ago 
The whole town was basically an industrial smelting compound for charcoal pig iron, and Fayette was famous for its grime. Not crime, grime. According to one sign here, Fayette had no local dump. Residents threw their garbage in the harbor, along Slag Beach, down outhouse toilets, or into streets and yards. In 1879, the Escanaba Iron Post reported, Fayette is not a model of cleanliness, and it is difficult to keep everything in an apple pie order. But there is no excuse for those alleys. Another visitor said, The huts were built on the very edge of the street, in front and around them. Hens scratched, and hogs wallowed in the mire. Oh, the stench that met them on every hand, and the filthy, raged children. Scattered around the former cabin sites, archaeologists have found layers of nails, broken ceramics, pieces of bone, jewelry fragments, and more, confirming the written description of Fayette's filth. Hearing all of that, the morphing thing makes a lot more sense. It's sort of a wonder every building doesn't hold a similar display. But honestly, all of that sounds so far from what you see today. If these houses were for sale, I'd probably buy one for a summer retreat. With a couple small yachts in the crystal clear water, it feels like a tiny slice of old New England than it does an abandoned stretch of industrial frontier. Looking out at the small cliff face, with the bell of a nearby buoy ringing softly in the background. That is the actual Fayette buoy, by the way. Again, we take our realism quite seriously at Hometown History, when it's convenient for us, and when we can afford it. In our next episode, we'll be heading into Copper Country, the so-called Copper Peninsula, which is a tiny, strange, antiquated world all its own.